On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and you'll meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him, and say to the owner of the house which he enters, The master says, Where is my dining room? in which I can eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, furnished with couches, all prepared. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples set out and went to the city, and he found everything as he had told them, and prepared the Passover. And as they were eating, he took some bread, and when he had said the blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. Take it, he said. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had returned thanks, he gave it to them, and all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant which is to be poured out for many. I tell you solemnly, I shall not drink any more wine until the day I drink the new wine in the kingdom of God. After psalms had been sung, they left for the Mount of Olives. I had a good weekend last weekend. Usually weekends are good. Usually I enjoy them. But last weekend was a little bit special because we got to celebrate the 50th wedding anniversary of two of the parishioners. They'd chosen that day to renew their wedding vows and ask once again for God's blessing on their marriage. And it was a lovely occasion. They're lovely people. A couple of weeks before that, I'd been given the privilege to celebrate the wedding of a young couple in Troon. The priest was unwell and they'd asked if I would be able to celebrate the wedding for them. It was a lovely day. Women had gathered at the gates of the church and I was talking to them, saying, oh, I love a good wedding. And they were there to see the bride, to see what she looked like, to see the dress and to go ooh and ah. Some of them were saying, oh, it's probably a year since they've seen a good wedding at the church in Troon. And it was lovely to be there. And it was a lovely day. It was a lovely wedding. They were a wonderful couple. They are a wonderful couple, Emma and Grant. And although the wedding follows pretty much the usual pattern most weddings do, there's also those little things that that make it different unique to that couple, special for that couple. They chose the readings, and they choose the music. The people who are there make it different to other weddings that I've been at. And it's all lovely, it's all wonderful. But there were a couple of things that stood out for me on that day. One of them was the bride had a frock fluffer. I'm quite used to bridesmaids swooping in and rearranging wedding dresses when the the need arises. But Emma had a professional frock fluffer, someone who was there in the shadows and would appear whenever the bride moved to make sure that the dress was displayed appropriately and trailed wonderfully around the church. She did her job very well. For all I joked about her, she did her job well, and Emma looked fantastic. The other thing that was a first for me at that wedding was when the best man presented the rings, just as they were to be blessed, he opened the case in which he kept them, and a light came on in the case, and they were illuminated by this wonderful blue-white LED light. And the congregation went, ooh, and I had to smile. But you know, although I thought it was quite funny at the time, 
the more I thought of it, yeah, the more I kind of liked the idea of making a little bit more about the rings, making the rings visible because most of the people sitting in the congregation don't see them. And, and the rings are important, aren't they? The Wedding Rite talks about them being reminders of their faithfulness and their love for each other, but, but they're more than just reminders of that. They're, they're expressions of it. Putting a ring on somebody's finger is an expression of love and of commitment. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, I like that idea of making a little more. I know that the ritual of wedding, the ritual of marriage, does make something special of the rings, but symbols are to be seen. And at that point in the wedding, they're, they're not, except by the bride and the groom, maybe the best man. And as I sat down to think about today's feast of Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, I was thinking of symbols and symbolism. And I was thinking not so much of what Christ gives us in the Eucharist, but of how we receive what he gives, how we accept his gift. One of the things that came to mind was that phrase, taking the king's shilling. When sailors or soldiers were enlisted, the recruiting officer, the recruiting sergeant, would press on them a shilling. And in accepting the king's shilling, they were accepting to serve. But accepting Christ in the Eucharist is more than just accepting the role of, of service. There's something of that in it. In, in accepting the gift that Christ gives, we make a commitment to live worthily of that gift, to respond in the manner intended to that gift. But the response is more than just service. I think it's more akin to giving and receiving, exchanging rings. Receiving Christ in the Eucharist is, it's about relationship. It's about commitment to Christ, not just to service. It's about love. Every time we receive Christ in the Eucharist, we renew our commitment, not just to a life of service, but to a relationship, to a life of love, love that finds expression in service. Just as Harry and Betty renewed their commitment to each other 50 years after they first made that commitment, we renew our commitment each time we receive Christ. But Harry and Betty may have waited 50 years before they renewed the words that they exchanged. However, they lived that commitment every day in between. And that too is what we are called to do, to live the commitment that we make Yes.